This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 723, recorded on February 23, 2021. I just realized that. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Well, Vincent, um, looking out my window, I see clouds, uh, probably nimbostratus variety, low f- flying, probably moisture laden. The temperature is uh, moderate in the low 40s, high 30s. I don't have a thermometer, so I can't tell you. But And then yesterday was pretty grotty. Today is pretty, it's getting better. Dixon is discombobulated because this is his first Tuesday twiv, right? Dixon? Yeah, I, I feel out of sorts. <laughs> the feng shui is all messed up. For, I'm sorry. Yeah, you got it You'll right. get used you to it. it. Right. Also I joining will. us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, believe it or not, I got the window open. It's <laughs> 75 degrees and brilliant sunshine. Oh, it's, it's more typical, go f- right? Go figure. Yeah, that's what happens. From Madison, New Jersey, Brienne Barker. Hi, it's great to be here. It is 41 Fahrenheit, and there's a little bit of sun trying to peek through the clouds here. We have a guest today from Birmingham, Alabama, somebody I have known for many years as a podcaster. She's the creator of the Brain Science Podcast, and she also happens to be an emergency room physician there. In Birmingham, Ginger Campbell. Welcome to TWIV. It's great to be here. In Alabama right now, it is where where I am, 70 degrees, 21 degrees Celsius, sunny. I played tennis for three hours yesterday, even though last week it was freezing and snowed here. But not, we didn't have Texas. No. No, no. So, Ginger, wasn't I on one of your podcasts during the 2009 uh, influenza pandemic, if I remember? No. Um, no, I think I probably interviewed Paul Offit around that time, though. Okay, I thought I I spoke with you, but I've so Ginger has the Brain Science podcast, and um, that then Ginger decided to get science podcasters together and uh, made something called sciencepodcasters.org, where she she curated basically all the science podcasts she could find. Right? It didn't last too long, though. Well, what happened was the National Science Foundation started their own website. Right. And I figured we weren't going to compete with that. But you were one of the big supporters of sciencepodcasters.org, so thanks. It was a great idea. And, you know, the thing that the NSF started, 360.gov, is now gone. They took it down. So I I wanted to, before before we talk about COVID, um, we'll talk a little bit about podcasts. But before that, give us your background, uh, you know, where you're from and, and where you're trained and so forth. And why? <laughs> why? Um, I was or why born, not? <laughs> I was born in Seattle, Washington, and my dad worked for Boeing. So I ended up in Alabama during Apollo in in um, Huntsville, which is north of Birmingham, and that's that's where I grew up. Uh, got married, moved to Birmingham, where I've been over for over fifty years. I started out as an engineer and decided to go to medical school. Uh, I don't exactly remember why anymore. (laughs) Um, I spent, I went to the University of Alabama School of Medicine, now known as UAB. And um, I trained as a family physician, but have spent most of my career in the emergency room in rural Alabama, which is mostly primary care anyway in the emergency room, since it's the safety net for people. Um, In 2014, I decided to go back and do a fellowship in palliative medicine, and I now practice palliative medicine at um, the VA hospital in Birmingham, and I um, have a faculty appointment with the School of Medicine, which they don't pay me, which is good because I don't have to go to meetings. But I, but I get to teach, which I love because all the years I was in rural Alabama, I was usually the only physician in the hospital, you know, for most of my 24 hour shift. So getting, you know, to teach young doctors and um, medical students is very rewarding. So were you living in rural Alabama or did you commute to rural Alabama? I commuted. I commuted. Yes. 
Yeah. I didn't realize Always, you, I didn't realize you were in Birmingham. I, I I was there a couple of years ago. I visited the university. There's a bunch of virology there, by the way. And who's the the lady who owns the cafe right across the street? It's a famous little mom and pop cafe. Do you know that coffee shop? Doesn't ring a bell. Mm. People at, people at Birmingham will know who I'm talking about. So first of all, it's Birmingham. Birmingham, okay. okay. <laughs> Birmingham is in England. Birmingham, <laughs> Birmingham is in Alabama. Birmingham. Actually, Birmingham is in England. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But at any rate, it's Birmingham. <laughs> okay. I'm trying to Birmingham, be proper. That's right. Because I, I, when I mispronounced <laughs> exactly, the, the English exactly. ones, the English criticized me. Birmingham figures that we would call it Birmingham. Okay. And why did you do the podcast? So you're not too far from Bessemer? Uh, yeah, Bessemer is a sort of a, well, suburb would be a exaggeration, but it's, <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, are the mills still turning out ingots? I don't think the mills are open anymore, but I'm not positive. When did you start Brain Science Podcast, Ginger, and why? 2006. Ah. Uh, uh, in 2005, I don't know if you remember, podcasting appeared in iTunes. And the first time I heard a podcast, I was like, I want to do that. <laughs> but I didn't know what I wanted to make a show about. So it took me a while to come up with an idea. And you remember discussion forums were popular back then. And I was on the forum for another show called The Sci-Fi Show. And I did a little episode for them about a book about uh, by Jeff Hawkins, who invented the Palm Pilot. And... Once I recorded that, I was like, this is it. I could do neuroscience and I'll never run out of material. And my reason for doing it was the coverage of neuroscience sucks. You know, it, it, well, that's true for science in general, but um, the coverage of neuroscience is so superficial and hype laden. I just wanted to produce something that was accurate that so people would be able to know what the truth was. Kind of like what you do. Hmm. Yeah, we started in 2008, just two years down. And uh, yeah, it was the same idea. I had I discovered podcasts and I thought I want to do this for virology. And, but I was inspired by Leo Laporte, who I think you knew also, right? Oh, yeah. I was also inspired by Leo Laporte. Yeah, that's why. You I, used to answer emails a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is that so we still I will, do? <clears throat> I will freely confess that um, though I'd heard of it, I hadn't, I don't think, well, it's interesting. I don't think I'd listen to any of your podcasts until today though if i look back through the list of what's available there's a bunch that say played at any <laughs> rate i listened to your most recent um bruce goldstein it's yeah. <laughs> uh bruce goldstein uh uh which i found fascinating and uh, uh is this sort of your standard format interview and author of some neuroscience book or something Right. When I started out, I didn't even know I was going to do interviewing. I was just going to talk about books that people needed to know about, but probably weren't going to read. But I got into interviewing pretty early on and discovered that it was it was a really great way yeah. um, to bring information to people. Um, so, yeah, that's what I do now. My show is monthly and I usually pick a book by a working neuroscientist and interview the neuroscientist. And I try to vary the technical level between a general audience and more technical. So for example, Goldstein's a very basic episode. So it's, it's the, it's a good starter episode. So that was good luck for you. But, um, but I, I have a really diverse audience ranging from I actually have heard from tattoo artists and house painters and people like that. And then working neuroscientists, maybe 10 to 20 percent of my listeners are MDs or PhDs. So, you know, writing, doing stuff for that diverse of an audience is, is an ongoing challenge. Um, but I think I've proved that you actually can do it. Well, um, I think neuroscience <laughs> is, is perfect for this because, you know. Uh, everybody has a mind, uh, and everybody, most people know that it's confusing in there. Uh, and you get insights through, through the podcast. It's, it's a memory thing. Rich. I have a t-shirt that says so, the show for everyone who has a brain. And you would be surprised at how many times people will come up to me and say, well, I can't listen to your show because I don't have a brain. 
<laughs> Sounds like the straw man from uh, Wizard of Oz. Excellent. So uh, are you amazed at how many universities have invested hundreds of millions of dollars in brain centers? And ours is one of them. Why don't we spend all that money and establish a gigantic place where everybody can come and just work together? <clears throat> It seems like a lot of duplication. And you don't do that in virology. <laughs> yeah, but I don't. I think that when you've got networks like this to talk about, I mean, our brain center wants to envision the entire brain. That's yeah. Come on. So you want do you, you want a centralized brain happen. institute or a network? A network I mean, it's like the brain. astronomers that say we don't. Our our the astronomers say we have we don't have a big enough telescope, so they use all the radio telescopes around the world, and now we have a big enough telescope. That sort of well, thing. there is there are people working on making sure that their data is um, accessible to everyone, especially the imaging data is really important not to duplicate mm -hmm. and to make it. Okay. You need large data um, sets mm -hmm. in order to really draw conclusions from things like um, functional imaging. Right. So there's a lot of people working on that, developing tools. Um, to, to share what they're doing. So that, that is happening. It's just that nobody's going to all go and live in the same place. I don't think that's going to happen. No, well, they, 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 no, in a virtual world, that's that you don't have to do that anymore. But the other thing that's fascinating, because I'm a parasitologist by training and a lot of my bugs mm -hmm. have brains. Uh, and so I'm wondering in your view, how far down the phylogenetic tree from humans do you have to go before you completely understand the nervous system of that organism? Which one do you feel most complete in knowing? Me? Well, you know, the only, <laughs> the only one, the only one we have question? that um, uh, a wiring diagram for is C. elegans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and it only has, yeah, it aspirous. only has yeah, 302 right. neurons. And even though we know the wiring diagram, we still can't predict everything that's going to happen. Someone. That's my point. Yeah, that is my point. And the other thing is that all the drugs that we've got to get rid of these damn things, they all attack the nervous system in some way. All of them. They make the worm feel as though it's not home. So it lets go and then passes out, basically. Uh, it's, it's fascinating stuff. So, fascinating so stuff. Ginger, I was wondering how you actually choose the books that you're going to talk about on each episode. It's very idiosyncratic. It's what I think is interesting. Uh, <laughs> I have a really good relationship with MIT Press. They send me everything that they publish on neuroscience. And I usually get books from all the other academic presses, too. And, and so I mostly focus on academic presses now. Uh, for example, Goldstein's book is an MIT uh, press book. Um, if you went back in my back catalog, you'd find much, you know, more basic stuff. But it's really, you know, it's really kind of, I get sent books, I start to read them, I say, is there something new here that I want to share? Um, you know, most of them don't make the cut. How many, Are you uh, afraid that AI will take over because we'll eventually figure out what the brain does and we can duplicate that and then the machines will take over? Not in our lifetime. Because <laughs> <laughs> Bill Gates Jr. and Stephen Hawking said, beware, because that's, that's you know, and I, I kind of fluffed it off, basically. Yeah, I've had a lot of, yeah, uh, you know, that's a subject that almost every book addresses now on some level. And yep. it's kind of yep. interesting, the different takes. I've got a couple of episodes coming up later in the spring where the two guests sort of have opposite ideas about it. So it's going to be interesting to, um, you know, to, to throw those out there and then listen to what people think. Yeah. How many yeah. episodes do you have, Ginger? I'm about to release 181. I'm way behind you. <laughs> well, we're weekly. So <laughs> I have to say though, that over the years we've had, uh, we've gotten listeners from you. They say, Oh, Ginger Campbell mentioned your, show and i'm here from that so thank you for that i think podcasts should do that with each other right help each other out in fact i think in the beginning um i was i, I did this weekly pick thing because of leo doing it on one of his shows and i picked your your podcast early on and i thought it would be a good way to connect podcasters right uh, sometimes it worked sometimes it didn't mm -hmm. but that's that's where i discovered you you know early on long time ago yeah, you tried to get me on one of you. Do you remember we were on, tried to be on something with Leo? I can't remember the name of the show. I had technical difficulties, so I didn't actually get on the show, but you did. Oh, that but, was probably um, a few years ago. Yeah, 
futures in biotech with um, uh, I forgot his name now. <clears throat> yeah, that was the guy who in, he, that was the guy who inhaled the mic. Futures in biotech. That was yeah. Mark Pelletier. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know, Leo kicked his show out. He decided it wasn't making any money, so uh, it's gone. And I had Mark on Twiv a few times, and uh, I got to have him back. Actually, he, he's an interesting guy. He does he's actually in biotech, and so he's got some interesting insights. All right, let's talk about COVID. Um, you had you had some things in mind you wanted to talk about, Ginger. So I'm going to just hand it over to you. I mean, we can we'll interrupt and ask questions, but. Tell us what you, you had in mind. Okay, so um, I thought th what motivated me to contact you was there had been a couple of questions um, submitted to Daniel about palliative care. And since that's what I do as my day job, so to speak, um, and I've been taking care of COVID patients, you know, for almost a year now, just like everybody else, um, I, I wanted, you know, to, to broaden that conversation. I thought that the first question that I really ought to address is just what is palliative care? Because there's a lot of people who don't understand this. And since you have a um, international audience, I'm going to go with the World Health Organization's definition. But first, I want to mention palliative care does not equal hospice, because that's what a lot of Americans think. Okay, so that's it. So according to the World Health Organization, and I'm paraphrasing, um, palliative care is a multidisciplinary approach to improving the quality of life of patients and their families when they're facing life-threatening illness. And the goal is to prevent and relieve suffering. And that includes not just physical suffering, but spiritual, psychological, and social suffering. And so palliative care is provided by a wide range. It's a team, interdisciplinary team. So we've got our nurses, you know, social workers, um, pharmacists, all these different people are part of palliative care. I use the expression palliative medicine to talk about what I'm doing as the, you know, the, the little bitty doctor part of the job. Um, as a physician, I mostly focus on two things. One is symptom management, you know, making sure people are relieved of pain and um, pain and shortness of breath, which is very relevant to COVID. Um, and then, but the biggest part, and this is really what I wanted to share with your audience, has to do with helping people make decisions that are in harmony with their personal values. And so what I wanted to do was to follow Daniel's example and sort of break COVID down into three phases, not the same phase as he's using, because this is from my point of view, um, and what kind of palliative medicine approaches would be um, appropriate during these phases. So I've defined these phases as Daniel's pre-exposure, then I will call it early illness and then later complications. So what should you do? You have not been exposed. Well, obviously the first one is get vaccinated. I follow up on Daniel on that one. And I think everyone should, if they haven't been vaccinated, figure out whether or not their community has monoclonal antibody treatment available so that if they suddenly realize they're getting sick, they know exactly where to go. But that's that's just my medical advice. As a palliative care physician, I'm going to say you need to know who is your debt, who is your surrogate, who is going to be the person who would make a decision for you if you got too sick to make your own decisions. Okay, this is something everyone needs to decide before they get sick. Um, and usually, you might pick like you know your spouse or something, but if it's a person who doesn't. Um, in the United States, every state has laws about who, what the chain of command, so to speak, for next of kin is. But if you have a person that you've chosen and it's not the one that would be the legal choice, then that's the when it's really important that you, you know, have done some paperwork. But the most important thing is once you've picked that person, you need to talk to them. Talk to them about um, your wishes. Um and especially the issue of intubation. I mean, that's the big, you know, elephant in the room, right? Would That's the question that usually comes when you read the questions on the um, emails. You know, when, oh, my mother says she doesn't want to be intubated, what should I do? I think we should start thinking about what we would want to do before it happens. So like back in April, 
I was of last year. I was like, no, I do not want to be intubated. I'm not even going to go to the hospital, period. That was my position. Um, I still don't want to be intubated. Personally, I'm 65 years old and the odds that I'm going to have morbidity or disability after being intubated, even if I survive are high. So personally, I would pick no. But the thing is, every person needs to pick for themselves and it needs to be on, you know, what's important to you. Right. Um, And that changes based on your age. But these are issues no one ever wants to talk or think about. And that's really why I wanted to, to, um, to bring it up. Um, so you've talked to your family and, and whoever's important. And then the last thing I would say is learn, this is in your pre-exposure phase, figure out what kind of palliative care resources your community has. I mean, if you're in New York, you've got lots of resources, but if you're in a rural community, you may not have very many resources, but you can at least figure out, you know, you know, what the, how the local hospice companies work or whatever. Questions? Can I ask you, sir? All right, go ahead, guys. (laughs) I have lots of questions. (laughs) Go ahead, Brianne. So um, I think uh, people, you know, I guess my age group doesn't necessarily think about this stuff a lot. Um, And so as you were talking about things like um, making decisions about intubation and finding out more about uh, your community, um, what resources would you uh, suggest that people use to actually help them make those decisions and to find out more so that they can make those decisions in an informed way? Okay. So first thing is, you know, figure out whether or not your local hospital has, says it has palliative care and you got to watch out for that because the real palliative care is mostly at university hospitals. Most community hospitals that claim they have palliative care have a nurse practitioner that says, Hey, you're going home on hospice period. So you got to watch out for that. Um, you could um, also just, you know, Google hospice in your community and figure out, you know, what the providers are. Cause almost every community is going to have, you know, hospice providers. Um, those are private companies that then, you know, provide the care. Um, and, and you could just go and say, you know, maybe go to their websites and learn. Most of the hospice companies will have information on their websites about what they have. And you can call the local person and say, you know, how are you guys handling COVID? Are you taking COVID patients? You know, cause that's an issue. Um, Uh, But I would want to know, you probably know what hospital you would go to if you're sick. Sure. So go to their website and look and see if they've got palliative care. That's where I'd start. So, so I, I was, I'm sorry, Rich, I I was always under the impression that to intubate or not is a physician decision, not a patient decision. Yeah. And that's part of the problem. So that, you know, where did that happen? Okay. So it, that's not the way it works in the real life. Okay. It, you have the right to, to decline any medical treatment that's been established by Supreme court cases. Okay. So you have the right to say you don't want to be intubated. It's just that everyone's going to assume that you do, unless you tell them otherwise, which is. Are, there's, are these patients that can actually speak at this point? Well, that's the, probably not, but that's the reason why these kinds exactly. of decisions exactly. needs to be made ahead of time. If you if you feel that you wouldn't want to do it, then you need to make that, you have to make sure people know ahead of time. So what does the physician tell the patient or the family of the patient of the pluses and minuses for being intubated or not? Um, probably not very much. I think the problem is they make it sound like it's for sure going to work. Right. I mean, that's one of the issues we have with young physicians is trying to get them to communicate that we hope this will work. Um, I'll give you an extreme situation that unfortunately is very common. Somebody has a cardiac arrest and, um, and they are, you know, now they're on a machine. Um, they probably have an oxic brain injury and the odds that they're going to wake up, not good. The team should be saying, you know, this is a bad situation. We're hoping he's going to wake up. If he doesn't wake up in three days, we're going to be facing hard choices. Give that gives the family three days to think about it, but, but nobody ever does it that way. Mm. We have a long way to go on having you know, what we call palliative care 101 among regular physicians. Um, so 
and, and that's the re, that's one of the roles of palliative care is to make people know you do have choices. You can choose not to be intubated. You can choose right. not to get CPR. The reason why you get CPR automatically is historic. I mean, think about it. When you go to the hospital, everything you have to sign, you have to give permission for. You have to give consent. Mm -hmm. They can't give you a blood transfusion against mm -hmm. your wishes. Mm -hmm. Okay. But you can get CPR against your wishes because you're not really in a position to refuse it when you're having a cardiac arrest. Right. And when CPR was invented, nobody really knew who it was going to be effective for. It was, well, we should do this just in case. You know, we now know that, you know, at least, you know, probably 90% of people are going to die in that situation, but we still do it as if it's going to work and it works 90% it works ninety of the time on TV. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so I have a so I have a couple of questions. First, um, uh, what are the current statistics relative to COVID um, about your outcome from okay, so, being right. intubated? So I'm going to work, I'm going to, you know, I work with uh, what I call ballpark figures, which I know are not, you know, the most up to date. But the one I work from is based on what I've heard from Daniel mainly is right now, if you're intubated, you got about a 50, 50 chance of surviving. And unfortunately though, you've also got better than an 80% chance of having some kind of disability on the other side. So those are the numbers um, that I would right. work from. Those are the very thing, rough numbers, but, but I think uh, that, they, you know, more detailed numbers aren't going to help the average person make a choice. Are these age and um, um, advantage versus disadvantage patient determined, or does this apply to everybody? That's my everybody number. Obviously, if you got dementia, <laughs> <laughs> you, your chances are going to be lower than than the 50 50 um but uh, so but i mean thing people, the thing is people die even though they have had nothing wrong with them before yeah. right the Strange other thing world. that interests me about this is your um is the what i would call a dilemma of deciding say even uh i mean i have a directive to physicians i've got durable power of attorney, all that kind of stuff. But deciding when you're healthy, uh, what you want done, okay? At the same time, I've always thought to myself that uh, you can never really know what it's like to confront one of these decisions until the decision is actually yours, okay? That your perspective, if somebody tells you you got six months to live, your perspective on how you might deal with that might be, it was likely, I don't know, seems like it might be different than imagining from a healthy state how you might feel about that. And so, you know, how can I make uh, a, a decision that's really a, a, a completely informed decision, a rational decision from a state of health about this? You, I don't, I'm not arguing that you should necessarily make a decision at the point at which I am in this conversation. I'm saying you should be thinking about it. Okay. You should at least be thinking about, well, um, there's a great book by Atul Gawande that I highly recommend um, called On Being Mortal. And in there, he has these four questions to ask patients to help them make decisions. And one of them is, you know, what do you have to be able to do for life to be worth living? Okay, the answer to that question makes a big changes as you age. I mean, you know, um, when, when I was 30, you know, it was not the answer that it is now. I mean, I take care of mostly older patients who, for them, it's being able to be with their family, being able to interact. So the real problem with what's going to happen if you have a cardiac arrest is what is the chance that you are actually going to be a conscious person who can interact with your family afterwards? Unfortunately, unless it is in certain situations, not good. Um, so, but, at, but I, is it okay if I move on to yeah, part two and yeah. because, okay. Sure. Um, okay. So now we've gotten, now you've got it. Okay. 
things are more interesting now you've got COVID. Um, early illness. So number one, you're going to go get your monoclonals if you can. Now is a point at which you do need to make some sort of tentative decision about what you're going to do. Um, and I already gave the 50% survival and the greater than 80%. But let's say, okay, you decide I, I'm, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to be intubated if, if I need to. That's, that's, I think that probably for a lot of people, that's still going to be a reasonable choice at this point. But there's going to be people that it's not a reasonable choice. Um, the 95-year-old patient with dementia, I've, I've sent two 95-year-old guys home on hospice because their family had the sense to say, we need him at home with us, not spending his last days on a ventilator. If you've made a decision, you obviously need to talk to your doctor. And also this is, you know, if you're sick enough that you're at the hospital, ask for palliative care. Remember that that does not mean that you're giving anything up. It just means you're going to have somebody to support you in um, arguing for your choices. The point of palliative care is not to tell people what to choose, but to make sure that they know they have choices and then help them think through those choices. And a lot of times it's helping the family to think through the choices. In fact, that's what it is. Um, and, you know, if a person has a poor life expectancy because they are already really sick, then it's time to think about hospice at the very beginning um, because the person could go home and spend the rest of their life at home. Maybe they survive, maybe they don't, but at least they're not spending that time in isolation at the hospital. And this is where we're really, really failing most of the time. And this is the reason why I really wanted to come on the show, because I want people to know that they do have these choices. They, I mean, most of the referrals that we've got where we've been able to help people in these situations has been because the patient's family has asked for it, not because the physicians thought of it. Right. Um, so you really, this is another one of those situations where you have to be your own advocate. It's kind of like AIDS was back in the eighties when everybody had to fight for, for treatment. It's the same thing. Patients need to fight for palliative care. It just doesn't, it's, it's not really necessarily on everybody's, um, radar. So Ginger, if I'm a 20 year old and I come down with the symptoms of COVID, do I run off and get monoclonals or do I just sit there and sniffle and blow my nose until it goes away like my granddaughter and her boyfriend did? Or am I a 65 year old that's at the cusp of being, you know, over the top, so to speak, you you have a long way to go. Believe me, <laughs> <laughs> I'm now 80 years old. So I I'm in another group entirely and I've got both vaccinations. So I'm, I'm okay. I feel good. There's still a small chance that I might catch it. If I start to get sick from this, that means the vaccine didn't work because my antibodies are no longer being produced or something weird is going on. And, and I need some special advice, but uh, at what point do you say antibodies or just go home and go away? You know, I, I don't, I think that that's going to have to be an individual decision. I mean, you know, my understanding of the antibodies is that they need to be given pretty early. So that's a, that's a complicating yes, thing. You can't right. wait till you're starting that's to right, get right. really sick and then ask for them. So therefore, you okay. know, um, I think I would be inclined given the fact that they're out there and they're available, that if I had access, I would go ahead and do it, but that's just my bias. I mean, I don't see the downside. Right. Um, now, of course, if you've already been vaccinated and you're already out, you could argue that it's probably not going to work. But that's that's a whole different issue. I mean, below the age of 30, you're bulletproof. There's no question about this. They're, they're absolutely bulletproof. They'll go to the beach. They'll go to the bars. They'll go to the restaurants. They'll go to class. They don't feel vulnerable. But you, you I, I've heard and you say that you watch um, the PBS News Hour, so you probably all the time. So you, you know, on on Thanksgiving <laughs> when they had that on Thanksgiving when they had that special episode where they showed all the people who had died from COVID. I know, I know. How many of those people were under the age of thirty? A lot. No, no, I I, I agree with you. <laughs> I mean, I don't 
have that attitude, but I know that everybody under that age does have that yeah. attitude. Well, They're hard know, to convince. I don't know if everybody does. One. When I when I look <laughs> at my students, uh, there there are some with that attitude, but there are also some who are sort of you know coming to me and they're like, "What if I wore five masks?" <laughs> <laughs> so, what I don't see is I don't see the students panicking by going back to school. I see the teachers panicking because they don't want to get sick from their students, even though that may not be the scenario that plays out. There's it's still the fear is mostly with the older group of people. And uh, that's a that's a tough issue right now, even to get vaccinated, I think, is a bigger issue that we I'm sure you're not going to get to that. But yeah, because you're already sick. You said you got sick early. So I just wondered in your own mind, do you have a cutoff for age group? Whether you uh, Well, you know, that's kind of outside of my where I'm working, because unfortunately, I'm at the other end of the story. Mm -hmm. um, so so that's part three. Part three is the later complications. And this is the other thing that I really wanted to talk about. Uh, you know, Daniel keeps talking about, you know, clapping people out and worrying about them coming back. And this really is a big deal. We are seeing a lot of people who were sick, you know, back in, you know, September, October, November, December, you know, now coming back and um, doing really badly. Um First of all, let's say you'd had the person who was intubated and they survived and now they are extubated. I would argue that it's time now to have the conversation about whether or not they should ever be reintubated. And this isn't happening, but I think we should be having it then while they can still remember how horrible it was. Because the odds of surviving a second intubation are I mean, I don't have a number, but I know it's bad. Um, uh, one of the intensive care doctors I work with um, was telling me last week he's working on a paper that's going to be published in Cell about the pathology in the lungs. And it seems to be that, and they are, they're doing a comparison between the pathology in the lungs of people who die from um, respiratory failure from the flu versus coronavirus. And what they're seeing is all these fibrotic changes. Uh, in fact, what the pulmonologists are saying is people's lungs are just turning into cardboard. Okay, they just, you know, they just don't move anymore. They're stiff. So if you get to that stage, being reintubated is not something that you're ever going to be on the other side of. But we're not having that conversation. You know, the pulmonologists know this. Uh, one of my colleagues is married to a pulmonologist and, and he's getting really depressed because he sees these people. He says, I don't know which path they're going down, but when they go down that path, I know that there's nothing I can do. And, and doctors hate things they can't fix. So people just need to know this. I mean, you know, yeah, you, you got, you survived and you're on the other side, but if you get the next stage, you get that fibrotic lung there's not going to be a lung, enough lung transplants around to fix that, okay? People just need to know that so that even if you want to be intubated the first time, I think the idea of even, you know, suggesting intubation the second time is, is you know, to me, bordering on, on feudal. Um, but most people don't, don't even know that. And the other thing that I want to talk about is the neurological um, sequelae. Um, Daniel's talked a little bit about this, but what we're say, seeing is it's COVID is like a, a dementia accelerant. If, if you got something, any kind of neurodegenerative thing, COVID makes it worse. Um, a lot of the patients I've taken care of haven't died from respiratory failure. They've died from what it did to their brain, whether they had strokes from the thrombotic or they just, their brain just quit working. They quit being able to swallow. It's something we're just seeing all the time, both in people that had dementia and people who didn't. And these are the sorts of things nobody talks about that I, I think, you know, we're talking about the long COVID, the chronic fatigue people, but these other people, um, this is a whole, you know, another, another end of it um, that I just want people to, to know about. Because one of the things that's happening is everybody is high, you know, nobody can go in the nursing homes. Nobody knows what's happening. 
it happens that the woman who who does my tennis courts um, drags them in the morning. Her day job is she's a nutritionist at a nursing home. And she said, yeah, definitely. They've, you know, because, you know, the nursing homes have been devastated with COVID. She's even had it. Um, Just all the patients being much worse. And we, you know, you assume that some of it's that social isolation part, but for the ones that had COVID, um, and I think we're just barely seeing the tip of the iceberg on this. And one reason I think this is important is that if you have a family member who has dementia and they get COVID, it's it's bad. I mean, you really should think about going on, you know, just going straight to hospice and, you know, making their time as good as possible. Um, but that, you know, that's my personal bias. Obviously I'm in palliative care because I belong, believe in, um, in um, palliative care. But that was, that was something that I really wanted to share. Um, I'm going to sum up with three things and then leave you with a chance to ask more questions. So the three things I want you to remember, one is ask for palliative care early. It doesn't limit your treatment in any way to say, I want palliative care. It just means you've got somebody else to talk to, to work through what your choices are. Um, COVID accelerates neurodegenerative diseases. And the third thing is, if you get recurrent respiratory failure, you have a very, very poor prognosis. Now, the um, can I ask you this recurrent respiratory failure? This is not necessarily a reinfection. This is more, you've got problems still remaining from the first infection, right? Right. right. So what will happen is the person will come in and, of course, they throw antibiotics at them but they don't get better. Um, I can think of one patient last week in the ICU, we were looking at his CT scan and it, it looked like, like the lungs of a person with what we call interstitial fibrosis. You know, that's a idiopathic disease that people get. That's one of the common reasons for lung transplants. It looks sort of like that, but the pulmonary fellow was showing us how to tell the difference, but um, it just does this, it's, You could think of it as scar tissue, kind of. It's sort of a simple way to think of it. Um, But it does this damage. In fact, it makes, um, you know, you're not supposed to be able to see airways on the edge of the lungs because they're supposed to be really small. But they get all collapsed, and then you have these big airways that you can see on the CT. I mean, it's really, it's pretty amazing how horrible it looks. And and there's nothing to do to fix it. Mm. And it, does it get worse with time? Yeah, I, I would guess so. I don't know the answer to that for sure, but it's already so bad that I'm not, I'm not sure what the word worse would mean. I guess um, I mean clinical progression, right? Yeah. I mean, I know um, a lot of people who say they walk, after recovering, they say, I walk upstairs and I can't breathe. Right. I mean, and I right. have a 26-year-old in my class who's in that condition. Right. Yeah. And I don't know, you know, I don't know anything about that subset of patients. You know, I don't know how much actual lung damage, you know, nobody's really studying those people yet. That's one thing Daniel's talking about. Right. So whether that person has any irreversible lung damage, I don't, I don't know. That's something we need to figure out. But I do know that the people that end up back in the hospital have got really bad lung damage. So there also cardiac damage? Yeah. Um, we aren't, you know, I, I have a skewed sample, so I haven't seen as much of that. I'm sure it's going on. The things I see is the stuff that happens in the brain. Um, obviously, all the thrombotic stuff, um, which includes causing people to have stro- strokes. Um, uh, those are the big ones. When somebody's in respiratory failure, they don't usually make it out of the ICU. So we don't necessarily take care of them at the end. We take care of more of the people that have the other things. But so one of the things that <clears throat> interests me most about this conversation is the ask for palliative care idea, because uh, this is a, it's, it seems like palliative care should be uh, a regular part of any physician's sort of menu. All right. And I don't think, I don't think that 
as I mean, your whole point in being here is that many people either don't understand what palliative care is and certainly don't understand that it, uh, even if they do understand that, that it's not necessarily on the top of any uh, physician's agenda. It reminds me of, I always thought that science-based medicine was kind of a funny uh, phrase because it struck me as redundant, but it's not. <laughs> yeah. So I, um, I, I want to ask you whether or not you've, uh, since you've practiced rural medicine as well as urban medicine, um, do you see a big difference with regards to this lung disorder that you were describing before from people living in rural places where the air is better, their lungs are, they're not smokers. We have to eliminate that as a factor. But, <laughs> and that's hard to do in some places, right? Because a lot of people are still smoking, but I work at the VA. I don't have any non-smokers. I, uh, I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> I do hear you. And now that we've legalized marijuana in lots of places, I'm wondering what that's going to do to everything, but still, um, there's got to be an environmental component to this someplace that that makes the difference between whether you tip the scales in favor of a, a serious outcome or whether you go on to recover. We've been teaching this for years that the air is cleaner and better in the rural parts of uh, the world than it is in the cities. You can tell if there are city people just by looking at their lungs on an autopsy. Ha ha ha. Um, so, you know, I don't know. Have you uh, noticed any trends that are worth talking about in this level? I don't have enough of a exposure to the to the rural patients. I mean, okay. they they do sometimes you know get sent to us, but you know since we're in the city, um, as as a city as Bering, as Alabama has, um, yeah. in in rural Alabama, there's a lot of health problems associated with various uh, you know chemical plants and yeah, sure, sure, paper sure. mills and all those different injustices. Yeah, that's yeah right. exactly. That's why I asked so, you about Bessemer before. <laughs> so I never, I don't think, I don't think of rural as being healthier. So, I mean, there's right. one county in Alabama that I won't name that I once worked in where I worked um, a shift on in the ER where I never saw anybody with teeth. Because wow. crystal met was so bad, so oh. so, <laughs> Lord. so so I have two questions for you. Um, in the time that you've been um, caring for COVID patients, have there been any other big trends in any other types of health conditions? Are there fewer falls? Are there more people with mental health issues? Are are, are there other flu infections going down? Or are there any other trends that you seem to have noticed during this time? Well, people are afraid to come to the hospital. So that's been sort of weird. Um, because like, for example, one of my coworkers did catch COVID. He did not catch it at work. He caught it from his kids who caught it from their nanny. They were homeschooling to avoid COVID and that's how they caught it. But yeah, <clears throat> um, <laughs> I mean, mental health obviously is is a big issue, um, especially like for us, um, families are a big part of what we do and not being able to have the families at the bedside um, has been very bad for everybody. Fortunately, we now have, the VA has some new rules that have to do with ending isolation you know, after 10 days, if the person's on the floor and after 20, if they're in the ICU with some other criteria, so we can get them off isolation and have their family be able to be with them. Um, but that's, I mean, I had one patient that I was bringing over to my unit to die and his wife was just excited that she was going to get to see him because she hadn't seen him since August. That, that's a Impressive. And it sort of actually ties into the other question I had for you, which was whether you personally had seen any changes in how you've dealt with uh, palliative care and patients or whether there have been any kind of big picture changes in palliative care over the past year um, with COVID. Hmm. Well, it's definitely difficult to communicate in a mask. And if you have to then put, you know, the other, you know, face guardy stuff on, it's almost impossible. Um, trying to have hard conversations with people over the phone instead of face to face is really, really hard. And I don't know why, but because the last two weeks that I worked, I lost four patients a week to, to, to COVID. And it was really hard. And I'm not really sure why it 
felt very different from losing patients to something else. I mean, I deal with dying patients. That's what I do. I lose my patients to cancer. I lose my patients, you know, but for some reason, the COVID hurts, it hurts worse. And I'm not, I'm not really sure why. I want to ask you about um, ventilators. You know, back in the polio day, we didn't have vents. We had iron lungs, negative iron pressure, lungs. right? And, you know, Daniel has suggested that that might be better than a vent. Maybe you would have better outcomes. Yeah. Any ideas there? Would you be better off on a negative pressure device? It's not invasive. Vincent, I am not enough of a pulmonologist to answer that question. I'm just going to say, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Now, let's just say someone says, before they come in, I don't want to be intubated. So what happens? I presume there's, you have a cannula first, right? That most people have no problem with, right? And that just does not supply enough oxygen and the person eventually... Okay, so yeah, that's great. Let's talk about what happens if a person decided that they didn't want to go in an aggressive direction. Okay, so um, that's where we come in because we are the experts on the comfort. And so that involves titrating the oxygen up to a point. And then the second thing that we do that is very effective is we use low dose opioids, things like morphine in very small doses because that takes away the air hunger. So it is, it is really not that hard to make people comfortable. But what you have to do is you have to quit chasing the numbers. Because what happens under normal circumstances is they're gonna look at your O2 sat and when it goes below a certain number, they're gonna turn things up. And when it goes below another number, they're gonna put you on a ventilator. Um, now, what we really don't know at this point is, well, what if we didn't do that? Okay. I don't have any numbers to tell you whether any of the people who decided, oh, I'm not, I'm just gonna go home, you know, maybe some of them get better. I don't know. Um, because what we try to do is get them, if possible, to be able to go home with hospice. And hospice knows how to do oxygen. Not, hospice, know, they give it to you automatically. Um, and they know how to do opioids. So they know how to keep people comfortable. And one of the worst things about people being in isolation is that it makes the kind of monitoring you need to do that effectively very difficult. So we just, you know, like kind of count the days. I can't, I've, I've, I've got a new system to answer Brianne's question. I now have a new system by which I put people on these little teeny, teeny doses, like drips of, you normally wouldn't start on a drip, but I'll put somebody on this little baby drip so that I know that they're not in, agony while the nurse is not in the room, but I know that I'm giving them such a little bit, I know it won't help, hurt, and then I can adjust it. That's, that's certainly, it's been a thing that I've changed, but I look forward to when they're not going to be on isolation, you know, because the nurses don't want to open the door. They're like, the virus is going to jump out the door. You know, they need to open the door and look at the patient, but they don't, it's like, is it really going to jump out? Um, I mean, I realize there's a certain amount of risk there, but if everybody's wearing their masks, I think that we should be relatively safe to open the door and look at the patient. Now in the ICU, they have glass rooms and you can see, but like, for example, in our unit, we don't have any windows. So, and neither on the floor, they don't have any windows. Those patients are in those rooms. If the nurses don't look at them, except for when they put all the gear on and go in, it's a problem. That's why I want my patient to be at home. <laughs> so I was interested in that because you're going to be sending somebody home who, well, I don't know what the assessment is. Are they assessed as being potentially infectious at that time? And if so, how do you deal with that in mm -hmm. the home environment? Mm -hmm. So normally everybody in the home's already been exposed, but I would assume that if you've got somebody who hasn't, they're going to be not. Um, the, I don't, I have one hospice that I call and they always take my patients and they, they deal with it. You know, they consider it part of their mission. Um, I don't know what rules they follow. Um, but I mean, I'm comfortable with the fact that probably 10 days out from a positive test, the person's probably not contagious. And right. a lot of the time, you know, that we're going from, their fir from the first positive test, which isn't usually when they became symptomatic, right? right. So 
they're even further out. So one of the things we've dealt with is just getting our nurses comfortable with the fact that the patients that we've taken off isolation probably aren't contagious because they're afraid to go in the room. They think the person might still be contagious, and that's an issue. Have there been any known infections in, in, in that way in healthcare workers going into rooms? That, that um, Most of the ones I know about have all been been air, airway things, you know, like during intubation, I that see. sort of thing. Yeah. Um, I know one of our intensive care doctors got it, and I think that there was some – Thing that happened. Um, our respiratory therapists don't do um, that. You know, they wear N95s all the time, and they they don't do nebulizers. They only do meter dose inhalers. And I don't know how you can get a person who is like semi comatose to do a meter dose inhaler. But you know, that's that. Um, so there's some things they won't do because they're considered high risk. Do you, we also um, uh, eye protection or just masks? Um, yes, eye protection. Okay. How about pushback from being vaccinated, a healthcare worker refusing vaccination? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm at the VA, which has been great for getting vaccinated. I got I got my first vaccine the within the first week that they were out. We had the Pfizer vaccine. I think I got mine on the second day that that the shots were being given. So, um, but it's optional right now. And that's that's an issue at some point. But they can't they can't make something that's EUA mandatory. So that's kind of a a problem. But they can take your job away though, can't they? Well, it hasn't come to that yet. Um, one problem is that that nurses get their information from a lot of bad places. Exactly. Yeah, and like then at pe- home. Yeah, and then people, well, like the news, and then people think, I mean, I had a nurse tell me that it came from a lab, and right. I was like, I wanted to pull my hair out. and Whose lab? <laughs> you, know, and, um, you mean it came from a labrador retriever? <laughs> yeah, and, and to me, this is frustrating because people, I'm sure you've seen the same thing. They get the information from their neighbor that's a nurse who was a horrible source of information, but because they're a nurse, they think they know and, yeah, right. um, yeah. you know, that's always been a problem. It's just sort of accentuated with COVID. Uh, well, every time there's a, a zoonotic disease, you blame governments or labs. Same thing happened with HIV until we identified this source. Sure, but sure. it's still sure. happening. It's going to continue until we figure out exactly where this came from, unfortunately. And, and you would be amazed that the people, I mean, there are academics who have subscribed to this. Of course, it's not... I get emails all the time. Can you believe this professor is saying this? It's not his field, though, or her field, you know. Mm-hmm. And I would say that it's not easy to understand the data, which clearly tell us it's not from a lab, right? And right. but that's. And I wanted to ask you: um, what, have have things been getting better now in the last few weeks? Yeah, I think I think we turn hopefully turned the corner a couple weeks ago. Um, the end of December and the and January were horrible, um, but I think I think we're turning the corner. I was looking at the Alabama numbers on the website today, and it, we I think we're into 14 days of decline, so that's good. And we it looks like about 73 percent of the vaccines what we've gotten have been given. So, um, um, I think we're making some progress on that too. Do you have any idea how, what fraction of the state is vaccinated? Um, it's like 700,000 people and there's like 5 million people in the state. Okay. Something like that. So, so but, we, but we've gotten like a million doses and we've given 730,000 yeah. of them out. So that's not bad compared to some states. Yeah, right. Uh, Ginger, anything else you wanted to put out there before we say goodbye? No. Um, oh, I did want to mention how much I enjoyed hearing Paul Offit back on again. <laughs> yeah, he uh, was great. So he was yeah. on Brain Science Podcast a while ago, right? Well, he was actually on Books and Ideas, Books my, and Ideas. my little yeah. obscure show, um, a couple of times. <laughs> That's where you review books, right? Um, everything from science to science fiction, anything that doesn't fit on brain science. Okay. All right. Yeah, I... I I've heard of that one too. <laughs> well, Ginger, anytime you want to come back and talk some more about this, you're welcome. Well, if you get if you start getting a bunch of questions, 
you know, gather them up. I'll be happy to come back and 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 um, start. I have tens of thousands of questions that we never get to. I mean, I know, I know. <laughs> and many of them, I mean, I made a separate email for Daniel, as you know, and and already I have more than I can possibly answer. So I, I'll send some to you, and if you feel that they're worth uh, or something you could answer, say they're all worth answering. Uh, we can have you back and we can do a Q&A because Daniel just can't do it, right? Um, I'm sure you're just as busy though, so. Well, I'm I'm sort of like semi-retired. Uh-huh. <laughs> so I work uh, approximately half time, but when I'm working, it's pretty intense. That most and of the time? When I'm, and then the rest of the time I work on my podcast. So that's my, <laughs> you know, that's that doesn't take any time, as you know. It doesn't take any time, no. But are you always in the ER or not always? No, I don't work in the ER at all anymore. Okay. I'm working purely in palliative care. Got it. All right. I, I, I In the old days, you were in ER, because I remember on the podcast, you used to talk about 14 days straight or something, right? <laughs> no, I never did that in the ER. <laughs> that would be crazy. But you do do extended... Yeah, I do do extended like seven, eight days in a row on palliative care. And that can be hard because you get the compassion fatigue. Ah, compassion fatigue. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. I, I never thought of that before. All right, Ginger. Ginger Campbell, BrainSciencePodcast.com. Been a pleasure having you, Ginger. Thanks so much, Vincent. Mm -hmm. Thanks, it was Ginger. great. Thank you. Terrific. This is really interesting. Enjoyed very, very Bye -bye. much. Boy, I got to say, that's sobering. Very much yes, so. You know, you could look at numbers all you want and half a million deaths. And, uh, yeah, and it doesn't that's right. mean a lot until you get some personal right. insight like that, yeah. right? You're right. You're right. You're all right. Not sure I'd want right. to be intubated. Listen, I remember when Daniel uh, first hit the wall when his hospital filled up. Yeah, sure. And he was busy 24 hours a day for seven days and he hadn't slept and he was just absolutely on another planet, basically. And I can understand that it could happen very fast. Well, I don't think you function well under those conditions. And as she said, doctors don't like to lose patients, right? That's right. And I, I guess, like to yeah, I mean, I guess with the, an infectious disease, a new infectious disease comes along, you're like, it's it's especially frustrating because it's brand new. You, yep. you think, gosh, this shouldn't be here. <laughs> Whereas the thing that really is, 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 is incredible is that Tony Fauci is still saying that a lot of this death could have been prevented had we uh, listened earlier. And I think that's absolutely I'm sure, true. I'm sure that's right. That's not even hindsight. That's just common sense talking but yeah. um it's a very it's it's it hurts to know that because we didn't do it nope no there, there are all kinds of models where you can see how many fewer in deaths or infections there oh, would yeah. be yeah but what's the yeah, point yeah. we just need to move on get people vaccinated now no that's true and that uh, very true. i think vaccination is is making an impact right it's, i would agree well it's uh the uh precipitous decline in cases is impressive it is. Yes. And I don't want anybody to get complacent. No. Because we've been wrong so many times before. <laughs> it's true. But we have I'm Easter hoping, and Mother's Day coming up, Rich. <laughs> but I'm hoping that this is the last the last surge. I would hope so, too. I can and, help. You know, you look at a country like Israel who's claiming that very soon they'll have over 80% of their population immunized. Yeah. And they're going to go back as if they never had it. That's their plan. It's as to if open they up never everything, had it. no masks, no distancing, no nothing. But they'll never gonna forget it. Experiment. Nobody's going to forget know, this. I know, I know, I know. I That's know. kind of like put put World War II behind you, you know, if you've just fought no, I, in it. Sure. So they're going to be the experiment that everybody's watching. I, I have a pick related to that, but you can Great. take a look at it. All right, let's do a couple right. of email here. Uh, I will take this first one from Jessica. Dear, es hello, esteemed TWIV hosts. I'm curious if the problems in efficacy in the Chadox vaccine, AstraZeneca in South Africa, are related to seroprevalence of chimp adenovirus neutralizing antibodies. I feel there has long been a presumption that chimp adenovirus would be a better vector because fewer people would have neutralizing antibodies in the general population. But to date, I've only seen limited studies that evaluate whether or not this is the case. Considering that physicians don't typically do anything about adenovirus infections, chalking them up to be a common cold, wouldn't it be possible that infection from a chimpanzee adenovirus would fly under the radar? Perhaps in the case of AstraZeneca vaccine, the vector is neutralized before the benefit can be achieved. 
I see a lot of media correlating the lack of efficacy on the composition of the variant, but I feel like it could be possible that exposure to Chad might be involved. Thoughts? Thanks for everything you do. I'm so happy that so many more people know what I'm talking about when I say my favorite podcast to have <laughs> stay safe and well. And her quote um, is from Martin Luther King. I have the audacity to believe that peoples everywhere can have three meals a day for their bodies, education and culture for their minds and dignity, equality and freedom for their spirits. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. So Kathy put some notes in here. Um, and we had discussed this previously on TWIV 718. Neutralizing antibodies to uh, chimp add Y25, the vector of the CHADOX1 construct, defined as 50% neutralization titer over 200. That's a dilution of 1 to 200. 0% in the UK population, 9% in Gambian population. And that's from a paper uh, in PLOS plus one, we'll, we can put the link to that. But of course, it doesn't answer the question of South Africa, right? <laughs> Is there any seropositivity in South Africa? There's no chimps that far south yeah. in Africa. Yeah, they're in zoos. So they would, they're in zoos. Yeah, in zoos. But how many true, people go right. to zoos? Um, and, and South and Africa is a zoo, zoo basically. Yeah. No, okay. no, I've been to South Africa. It's a yeah, zoo as they, long they, as you don't, uh, if you if you turn off of a major highway, you're going to see a giraffe, I can promise you. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're going to go to a game park um, and not to a zoo. If you're oh, they're, they're running around all over the right. place. Yeah, right. they're, they're not just in game parks. <laughs> right, but if you were to go to something. They're eating people's. Yes, I, okay, yeah, you're not, I have. You're absolutely right. I have watched a baboon steal <laughs> steal someone's uh, banana for lunch um, in South Africa. So exactly. <laughs> so we can. Exactly. So we are confident in saying there is likely no seroprevalence in uh, South Africa. Then, right? That would be my guess. I would okay. say low. So, so I uh, would very, uh, I would like yeah. to, for my own purposes, uh, review this general idea that the Chadox vaccine is somehow uh, less efficacious than say Pfizer or Moderna, or Moderna. Do you, do any of you have numbers uh, uh, on this? I mean, is, is this really a significant problem? Alan probably does. But. Well, so go ahead, Brian. They, they haven't done the full FDA review. And so the, the giant packet of data that we've seen for Pfizer and Moderna aren't available. Um, but we're also, they, these vaccines were also trialed in very different populations um, against sort of slightly different viral challenge, uh, given some of the uh, changes we've seen in the virus. And so I think the the numbers are lower, but I think it's a little bit of an apples to wrenches, I believe someone used yeah. to say. <laughs> and we don't really know what the numbers, well, I guess. Yeah, uh, I have some numbers. <laughs> uh, here's some numbers, Rich. Uh, South African Chadox, 2,000 participants got two doses, either vaccine or placebo. In the vaccine group, 19 were infected. In the placebo, 20. Both. Yeah, that's the one. That's those are the numbers that caused them to stop using. Yeah, them. Yes, right. and that's both variants. Uh, both cases, the South African B1135 was the infecting virus. But gee, uh, yeah, that's this is, this is the vaccine from the the larger the initial trials with a large number of people outside of South Africa. Whereas I recall, this was, this is the low dose, uh, high dose versus the two standard doses and blah, blah, blah. Different but the spacing over, of the timing. Yeah, but the overall was about 70% or something like that. Is that right? Yes. I believe that is correct. Because the, the standard dose was in the sixties. The half dose standard dose was, I think in the eighties and it averaged out at about 70%. What interests me when I think about this, so I recall from talking to Jason, is that this is uh, the one of the vaccines that are on the front line that does not have the prefusion stabilized yeah, right, spike. Right. And I wonder what the impact of that is. Because Jason was pretty uh, enthusiastic about uh, the effects of that uh, prefusion stabilization in terms of eliciting an antibody response in animal models so well, we we went over the the astrazeneca data remember and yeah especially where they waited a little longer in a certain group of people after that first dose and the protection was even higher right at least yeah. in the yeah, uk 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is it. I uh, this is why I wonder in the long run whether there's uh, going to be uh, a huge difference, in particular in terms of serious disease, between something that initially shows up as seventy percent and something that's ninety five percent. Yeah, I, I think it's a really hard comparison to make, and I agree with you. I, if I remember correctly, in their severe cases, they still had extremely high protection. Um, I, mm-hmm. you know, I, I'm recalling it being close to a hundred, but I don't know that I recall well enough to put money on that. I'm a little puzzled by the South African data. I mean, I think the numbers are small, first of all. And yeah, oh yeah. I just, I mean, if the Moderna Pfizer vaccines still give you neutralization with that virus, why wouldn't this one? I don't get that. Right. right? right. It doesn't make sense. Something's, something's off there. Right. Um, I agree. And canceling a million doses seems premature based on those data. Well, you know, it's not my job. Nobody asked us. <laughs> okay. Stay it's, tuned. This is all true. Maybe it's all about the T cells. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It could be. <laughs> they branded a lot of things here that are puzzles. Yes. Yes, they are. I mean, one thing we, we, we have to discuss this properly, but there are two little notes saying that, you know, after one dose of Pfizer, if you look in the second two weeks, you get really good protection, right? I'm thinking maybe that's all IgM and it's going to be gone in another month without a second dose, right? And people are getting so excited about this. Yeah, I would want to see a lot more about uh, describing those immune responses, you know, people Before are saying, oh, got- it's a crime not to give everyone one dose right now. No, <laughs> it's not. I heard someone who I can't reveal the other night saying, no, we have to do two doses. There's no data that says one dose is good enough by my view. And so uh, I, I just yeah, stay tuned. All right. That let's tends to be my feeling, too. Uh, Rich, can you take Lind, the next one? <laughs> Lind writes. Last night, my husband and uh, uh, my husband and I, facing yet another Saturday night in COVID nineteen isolation, began pondering the profound question posed by Rich. This was a pick of the week, I think. Why do wombats have cubic poop? Husband, a physicist, is trained to ponder important questions of the universe, such as this. He has a theory and wrote a poem to explain it. Please pass it to Rich. I think you will enjoy it. Lind. And here's the poem. The Wombat. With apologies to Ogden Nash. If you ever find a wombat, please don't challenge it to combat. Because this weird marsupial has really strange poop, y'all. Somewhere deep down in its colon, Eldritch processes do roll on. Pushing, kneading, squishing, squeezing, stretching, packing, shaping, teasing, till out into the light of day pop little cubes of poop. Hooray! So what does Wombat do with that little pile where once he sat? He stacks it up to make a wall, then hides behind and makes a call to lure his prey to venture near, not seeing that a Wombat's here. Then out he jumps, hurling poo at wallaby and kangaroo. Hurls each cube with such deadly force that it would stun a full-grown horse. And worst of all are those eight corners. If hit by one, you'd be a goner. So beware of cubic wombat scat. You can't be sure where wombat's at. (laughs) Quite good. Boy, you guys really are bored. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) that's great thank you that's great thank you yeah dixon yes i will be glad to lisa writes hello from south florida likely the only place in the nation without snow at the moment i'm a pediatric nurse practitioner and just listened to your interview with dr olfit Wow, he is fabulous as always, but what a fantastic discussion about not only COVID-19 vaccines, but about vaccines in general. My daughter was born in 2004. She became ill with a rotavirus shortly after her second birthday and a bit before the newer generation of rotavirus vaccine became available. When I left in the morning for work, she was perfectly fine. 
I got a call around noon that she'd been vomiting. I'm the opposite of an alarmist, but by 3 p.m., it was I was concerned enough. I left work early. I took one look at her and said, we're going to the ER. She was so dehydrated, she collapsed into a pile on the floor if she tried to stand up. The ER doc stopped at the doorway and before even walking in the room to examine her said, we'll run some tests, but I can already tell you I'm admitting her. Treatment is, of course, simply fluids and time. IV fluids when necessary. Fortunately, I live in a resource-rich country where this is readily available. I have no doubt that were this not true, she would have died. These resources cost me $10,000. That was my insurance deductible at the time, but the imperfections of our healthcare system are another discussion. When the new rotavirus vaccine became available shortly after this, it was, of course, an uphill climb to obtain acceptance from providers due to the past history of the previous vaccine. However, my response was, you're preaching to the choir, not convincing necessary, no convincing necessary. Thanks for all you do to continue to share factual information. Lisa, and she's a APRN and a DNP. Dinitrophenol, Brianne. Hey, I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Delayed type hypersensitivity reactions. <laughs> That's very, yeah, and rotavirus can be a problem, as Offit said, you know. Yeah. It can kill you. Dehydration, you need water, you need fluids. Exactly. Just like you die from uh, cholera. Brianne, can you take the next one? Sure. Anne writes, hello, I was listening to TWIV 720 earlier in the day, technically yesterday, and I'm writing to add to the interesting discussion about the various COVID-19 vaccine platforms and thoughts about using a heterologous prime boost prompted by the letter from a listener named Bill. I think it was Alan who mentioned something to the effect that there had been some discussion about setting up trials and added, I don't know if anyone is going to get around to doing them. The National Institute for Health Research, NIHR, is supporting a trial to begin to address this issue. Recruitment started a few weeks ago. According to an article on the NIHR website, the COVID-19 Heterologous Prime Boost Study, or COMCOV, will be looking at the safety and immune responses of using Oxford AstraZeneca and Pfizer BioNTech. Initially, the study will look at using Oxford AstraZeneca and Pfizer BioNTech Wow, I don't know how why I can't talk today. Um, for a heterologous prime boost in that order and vice versa, using two different dosing intervals, four weeks and 12 weeks, and homologous prime boost with each of the two vaccines at both dosing intervals, which makes for eight different arms as follows. Oxford AstraZeneca and Oxford AstraZeneca, 28 days apart. Oxford AstraZeneca, Oxford AstraZeneca, 12 weeks apart as a control group. Uh, Pfizer BioNTech and Pfizer BioNTech, uh, 28 days apart, Pfizer and Pfizer, 12 weeks apart as a control group, Oxford, AstraZeneca and Pfizer, 28 days apart, Oxford, AstraZeneca and Pfizer, 12 weeks apart, Pfizer and Oxford, AstraZeneca, 28 days apart, Pfizer and Oster Oxford, AstraZeneca, 12 weeks apart. And she gives a source. It will be interesting to see what they find, whether the combinations are safe and lead to an equal or a more robust and or more durable immune response, something Brianne had mentioned as a theoretical possibility. Ditto for the different dosing schedules for the heterologous and the homologous prime boost regimens. It would certainly make for more flexibility with the vaccine rollout. And if these new combos or dosing intervals turn out to cause a reduction in response or durability, well, that's clearly worth knowing too. The UK plans to add other vaccines as they become licensed. A related question for the TWIV panel. Any clue when we might get some laboratory correlates of protection? Thanks for the show. Anne from New York City. Um, and she has a PS. There was also mention on episode 720 of places to get vaccine information. I would add that the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, NEJM.org, has excellent COVID-19 vaccine FAQs. And share with your listeners who don't have subscription or access through a university library that none of the SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19 articles are behind their usual paywall. Hmm. And Brianne, when are we going to have correlates of protection? <laughs> A couple of years, probably, right? When we yeah, get I, I would say we, we've got to actually have some people who seem to be protected for some period of time and then see what really they do have. some immune profiling, yeah. Do we have correlates of protection for anything? I mean, this is a really complex issue. Uh, well, I would say for polio vaccine, we, we are 
pretty sure that antibody is what you need to protect you against poliomyelitis. Yeah, I think that it's tricky because um, in some cases we know some things about how you clear the virus. And we assume that that is also correlates of protection, but that yeah, may not yeah, be a correct yeah. assumption. Didn't we ask Offit? I would have thought we should have asked him, right? <laughs> yeah, we should have. Darn. I'm not sure we did. Darn. I know that in the case of smallpox, retrospectively, this is, you know, still a vexing question. Really? Hmm. Yeah. Not, probably not going to be answered for smallpox, right? Nope. <laughs> I, I was... I told my class yesterday, I told them about the smallpox uh, vaccine stockpile and antiviral pox stockpile in the U.S., right? Right. Mm -hmm. and, they're, and they're in the chat going, man, we're better prepared for smallpox than we were for COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Good it's right. It's right. Yeah. By the way, you guys have heard, I'm sure, that uh, FDA has announced that if, if Moderna or Pfizer want to make a new mRNA, they, they don't have to trial it. Yeah, that's I right. That, that was yes. a good. That's, that's, that's very, good. very good. Yes, because <clears throat> they were saying we, we need six weeks of uh, phase right. one, but you don't even need that. That's right. good. Tell your class that we've had a lot more experience <clears throat> with smallpox than we have with COVID nineteen. That's it's the true. reason why we know. That's true, but uh, you know, we're. Someone asked, "Is smallpox gone?" In the chat, right? Right. right. And right. Uh, I said, "No, actually, the virus is still in what we think is two places, but you know, there's this stockpile just in case." And um, right. somebody then said that. All right, let's do another round here. Uh, Henry writes. CDC guidance recently changed to allow mixing Pfizer and Moderna mRNA vaccines in extraordinary circumstances. In the case of my wife, when I made her appointment using the Walgreens scheduling software, first appointment was not available locally. I chose one an hour away in Manhattan. Software had greater choice for the second appointment. I foolishly chose a local pharmacy. Each of us received our first, first vaccine, Chi Pfizer in New York, me Moderna at the local. We asked the two pharmacists what would happen in a month. And they said that each site only offers what it has and that likely the local site would only have Moderna and they won't mix and match. The scheduling software in theory allows one to reschedule it, but the reschedule second dose only button is grayed out. And in any event, this is all constrained by supply limits and millions of people trying for appointments. Both of the mRNA vaccines code for spike. I understand there's some differences between encapsulation and so on, but it's hard for me to understand why mixing and matching two vaccines that code for the same protein would be a problem. Maybe there are some minor differences, I ask, because we may be reduced to starting over and scheduling two appointments and then canceling the second. But since the scheduling software doesn't reveal which vaccine each pharmacy is offering, there's no assurance I'd be able to get a first dose, a first in quotes dose of Pfizer. Yeah, um, you would only know after you got it. I, they, I agree. I don't see why it should be extraordinary circumstances, right? I mean, it's really the lipid nanoparticle formulation that's different. So... Was different. I think they're just being very cautious. But I would argue that this is a, an extraordinary circumstance. It's called a pandemic. Yeah. And right. <laughs> we should allow this. Right. But uh, similar to, not certainly not identical, not but identical. similar to the logic of the uh, single uh, single dose versus two doses. Um, yeah. You know, the, 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 the safe default decision is to stick with the data sure. from the trial. OK, uh, because if you deviate from the trial, you're in untested waters. You don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, Theoretically, exactly. I totally agree with you. Yeah, there agree. shouldn't be any you're problem. Right. You're right. But my humanity is showing through. Uh, but you're right. You should go by the science. That's not very grumpy of you. <laughs> I'm getting old, Dixon. <laughs> no, that's not a well, I think I, I think I <laughs> tell me. About I think I commented as we were talking about this uh, earlier that I think in the way in the future if we're still vaccinating people. I don't think these are going to be questions. No. And I don't know no. that there will be trials covering all of it. It'll just be It's amazing nobody how the will, questions have changed. Yeah, nobody will ask what you got before. They'll just say, exactly. oh, you need right. to update your coronavirus vaccine and you'll get whatever's right. Around. Right. I agree with Rich. We should go by the science, but these it's the same RNA, mRNA and yeah. a little fat around it is different. I, it doesn't make any yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I I agree with what everyone is saying. I think that with the, you know, when I think about 
the textbook science, I don't see reasons why this could be a problem. And I do see reasons why delaying the second dose could be a problem. Yeah. Um, sure. And so, you know, when I look at this, I, my gut reaction is, oh, it should be fine, but you're right. We should be, you know, going with what was done in the trial. Uh, Rich, you're next. So where did I read that um, somebody who has had COVID, the infection, and then gets vaccinated has a stronger immunity than people who have been vaccinated twice? I read that somewhere recently. Yeah, but that's I, I kind of I anecdotal. Let's in, see the sure. paper. Let's see the paper. I've heard that too. It's it's anecdotal. You know what that is, Dixon, right? Right. Um, let's, that's an antidote. That's right. I knew yeah, her. Let's see the data. Rich, you're next. <laughs> Sean writes, Dear Vincent and the TWIV team. Sounds like a rock group. <laughs> 61 degrees Fahrenheit, 16C. Thanks, Kathy, for that conversion mnemonic. In Las Vegas, where I'm sheltering with my in-laws, I'm just the owner of a small improv comedy theater in New York City, but an avid listener of TWIV, or at least since March 2020, when we made the difficult decision to suspend all of our in-person operations. It was quite a shock business-wise, but well worth it in an effort to protect the health of our staff, performers, patrons, and the greater improv community. In these uncertain times, I owe you a debt of gratitude for being a trustworthy source of relevant information when I have needed it the most. Your discussions, knowledge, and banter have accompanied me on countless walks and kept me sane. Thank you. I've learned so much from your podcast that I'm the go-to guy in my family for questions about everything SARS-CoV-2. This came in handy when my wife, Robin, who is an amazing singer impressionist, asked for my help writing a character piece about Dolly Parton and the Moderna vaccine. Here is the result. And, uh... It's got a YouTube link that I haven't looked at. We need to look at this. Please uh, feel free to share if I got the if I got the science right. I hope we did you guys proud. Stay safe, Sean. P.S. My wife bought me a twiv hoodie for Christmas that I wear as often as I can. These things are comfortable. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. I will have a look at this uh, YouTube uh, video. I need to actually boot the thing now. Ah, sorry, so I didn't look at it. Did anyone else look at it? No. I, I did not look at All it, right. but I do agree with yeah. Sean about how excellent the hoodies are. <laughs> Dixon. <laughs> yes, sir. Ingrid writes, hello, Twiv. Thank you for your informative podcast. I am completely hooked. Here's a follow-up question to episode 720. Dr. Offit described that the goal of reaching herd immunity is to get viral transmission down to such a level so as to avoid hospitalization and death. What about those long haulers, however? I know several individuals personally who were never hospitalized, but nevertheless suffer from debilitating long haul COVID. Surely this is something we would want to avoid moving forward. Ingrid, Queens, New York. Yeah, really good question because a lot of long well, yeah. haulers have asymptomatic infections, and they do. You know, maybe the vaccine is, true. is not preventing that. That it's not something we're looking at, is it? I mean, we there's a little bit of data no. trickling out about prevention of transmission and prevention of infection, and I suppose if we had some better answers there, that would partially address Ingrid's question. But I think Ingrid has a great question. Um, yeah. We don't have an answer, but the people – now, you remember that <clears throat> Moderna was going to do a study on college campuses to look at transmission, and we heard it was canned for lack of funds. But I heard Sunday night now that they got money to do it, and it's going to go forward. So that's the kind of thing we need, uh, Ingrid. That's a really good question, really good so, uh, Vincent, aren't the 48,000 people or however many with, that were in the Pfizer vaccine's uh, mm -hmm. third clinical trial, uh, aren't they being followed for yeah. two years? Yep. Yep. We'll get data from and that, so those, too. There will yeah. have a lot of people that were asymptomatic, right? Those, so that should Maybe. emerge from that group, yes. I think. So if they follow them for two years, we'll see if any of them get long COVID. And if none of them do. Yeah, exactly. Great. Then hooray. Great time, right? I mean, I would <laughs> say you don't have to probably Absolutely. don't have to wait two years. You probably will know in maybe that's six right. months that's or so. Right. Right. That's right. That's right. 
And by the way, when is it going to become an officially approved vaccine? Well, what uh, actually, first of all, the word is licensed. Licensed, right. Okay. I meant that. Uh, Ed, Ed, I meant Ed, that. Ed, I'm sure, <laughs> is listening here and he will. Uh, he's probably yelling at us that drugs, drugs are approved. <laughs> vaccines are licensed. With the one exception that vaccines get an emergency use approval. And Offit's answer to your or authorization. Oh, authorization. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> thank <point>. you. <laughs> uh, and uh, Offit's answer to your question like is that these uh, vaccines may never be licensed. Okay. It could be that the, and uh, I take away from that, that the emergency use authorization may get us through this to the point where it's not worth the time, effort, money, et cetera. I mean, we may take care of the disease. Okay. And it takes a lot more uh, time, effort, money, follow up to get licensure. There may be uh, no mo uh, motivation to do it. Do you think this will carry over to next year when there's another round of infection and you see a bump? Uh, I'm hoping. I'm then hoping what? this is the last bump. <laughs> I and I, and, and I we will with you. we <laughs> will maybe have maybe at most have little bumplets, but within bumplets. the uh, <laughs> but within the next year, uh, reach a a kind of an equilibrium with this dude. But that's just me being hopeful. But, you know, as Pfizer and Moderna and the others are following for two years, they're collecting data, they're spending money. So I would guess they're going to submit for a licensure because I, I think we're going to so use these vaccines for quite a while. It's not just a one-off one, one -off deal. Other companies know? might want to produce them and they can obviously make use of the license in order to do that, right? Yeah, and also anybody could buy it then on a, on a license. If you have yeah, exactly. it, you just, exactly. no, not everyone can buy it otherwise. So I exactly. I don't know. What do I know? Off it says that he's you the know, vaccine you know a lot. person. You know a lot. He's the vaccine person. Brianne, True. you're next. Sure. Marsha writes, I am an avid TWIV listener. You have done us all a great service. My question is, my husband and I have had both doses of Pfizer. We find that it is almost two weeks later, and my husband, who is 81, is very much more tired than usual. Speaking to all our senior friends that have had their second dose, they are all complaining of this same feeling of exhaustion. Could it be related to the vaccines and our not-so-great immune systems? Thanks for all your great insight and information, Marsha. As an 80-year-old, I cannot confirm this. I've always been tired. <laughs> <laughs> so the background is too high, huh, Dixon? That's right. Exactly right. There's no difference. I, I, you had two hits of Pfizer, didn't you, Dixon? I did, of course. Two and, hits. Uh, <laughs> two hits. No, no. It, it, I had no second dose reaction, and I felt the same all the way through. I, I feel great. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry to hear that other people are not feeling as great, but... Uh, Marlene, my wife, who had the Moderna virus vaccine, um, got a little bit uh, feverish and um, some malaise actually the next day, but not for the not for the Pfizer. Pfizer. Um, Pfizer. 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 I don't know. I this is beyond me, but I think people are tired, right? Yeah, <laughs> people are tired. You got it. And especially more tired than usual. But it could be sure. that if you have a particularly <laughs> vigorous, you know. React, what yeah, is it? Reactogenicity yeah, yeah. in the second dose. It could yeah. wash you up for a while. Well, anyway, Marcia, we don't have any insight into this. We're we sorry. Don't. We, we, we don't. do not in, have insight. In fact, That's right. <laughs> I think that even some of the details of what's going on with the reactogenicity um, are slightly unclear. Yeah. Um, yes. So whether or not that unclear thing is influenced by age would be even more unclear. But I thought the clinical trials at least showed that people that age responded very well with antibodies. Yes, that's correct. Sure, but we don't know about the reactogenicity. No, we don't. No, that's true. But she was actually, whether it related to the, to the uh, immune systems not being so uh, perky. I and, think, uh, Marcia, that your tiredness is a sign of relief. <laughs> That you've right, got your two right, doses. That's right, exactly right. And you're just so you can, relieved now that you're not going right. to get really sick, which is. Remember that uh, there was a play called Waiting to Exhale. Everybody uh -huh. exhaled when they got their second COVID shot. That's that's absolutely right. You'll be fine in, in, in a couple of weeks. Let's do some picks. 
to wrap this up. Dixon, what have you had? You're here. Well, you know, Rich, I don't know what time you got up this morning to put that down, but I was last night and I and I oh, raced to do lot. it because I raced to do it because I knew if I didn't, you would be <laughs> yeah, well, you didn't beat me. I just dittoed you, that's all. Because I that's you know, did you watch it? I mean, it was absolutely stunning uh, to just see. Amazing. You should, uh, everybody should watch this. Do we want to this. tell the listeners what this is? Yeah, yeah, yeah well, tell us about it. No, you go ahead. You go ahead. You picked it first. Uh, okay, this is the... Uh, anybody who's a Twiv listener has probably already seen this anyway. This is the uh, a video montage, really, of the Perseverance rover's descent and touchdown on Mars. It's the initial NASA video. And it's uh, real. And, uh, yeah, I mean, these this is not uh, these simulated. Machines, this is real. These machines are bristling with cameras. Absolutely. Okay? Because they anticipated all this. So they had a camera on the back shell looking right. up in the direction of the parachute. Right. And they had cameras all over the descent stage that exactly. could look down during the descent. Then they had cameras on the underside of the descent stage <laughs> and on That's the right. top of the rover so that they could look at the crane operation. And they put all these together. And remember, for folks who watch this on TV, you saw this narrative of what was going on. But that narrative was going on 11 minutes after everything Correct. had already happened. That's right. That's right. Okay? That's because right, it that's takes right. that long for the signal to get from Mars to Earth. But in this case, they had the opportunity to take these pictures and and overlay it with the narrative. So They're you phenomenal. see this whole thing happening in they real are time. Phenomenal. And it that's is phenomenal. amazing. You that's see true. the parachute pop. You see then the, uh, from the perspective of the descent stage, you see the um, heat, shield. Uh, heat shield separate. That's then right. you see this gently swaying while the exactly, parachute exactly. is letting it down. And then all of a sudden that steadies because they let go of the back shell and the descent stage is activated. And then you see the whole crane maneuver from the perspective of both the rover and the descent stage. Right. I am just totally blown away. This... This, even though it's robotic, or maybe even uh, because it's robotic, this trumps even the Apollo moon landings. This is right. just absolutely. And you even saw the dust Mars kick up. You see the dust kick up as the yeah. uh, as the uh, the uh, sky crane lowers the rover down onto the ground. It's just uh, phenomenal. It's just phenomenal. The it's pictures are so clear. It's amazing. They are crystal. Yeah. There's no atmosphere. Absolutely you don't. Crystal. It's nothing to cloud up, right? It's just no <laughs> well, haze. Don't be silly. No, no. Mars clouds over routinely once a year. What so. is the atmosphere of Mars, Dixon and Rich? Mostly what? CO2. It's CO2 mostly, and it's about one percent the density of what's on okay. Earth. Probably makes right, it helps to make it clear. That a parachute actually works, huh? Yeah. And they have <laughs> a little amazing. helicopter that the, they're going to yeah, actually a little helicopter. That's great. That's, that's going to be phenomenal. Very also. cool. That's going to be phenomenal. That was my pick. So, Rich, uh, hats off to that. Double and then I, I actually picked another thing that I recommend to you if you like jazz. I've talked about my my uh, cousin Randy and his uh, group. He's got a uh, live concert. Uh, well, I'm not sure if it's live. I think it is live, actually. It's called Soapbox Gallery. If you go to that website, you can either watch it for free or they say pay whatever you want. And it's uh, February 27th at 8 o'clock. And uh, he, he's doing very well as a performer. So I think that it's very difficult to find performance space now for people to actually watch. So I, I'm very proud of him, of course. So I would promote his career no matter what. So um, give him a listen and see what you think. Excellent. This is soapboxgallery.org, right? Yes, that's correct. Huh. Now, where, where does your uh, nephew, what is he? Sorry. Uh, he taught at Bard uh, Early College, which is a high school for gifted students oh. to get into school early. But right now he's, uh, he's full time studying to be a jazz performer. That's what he's doing. I thought it had and to be in you. Go. I thought it had go. to be inside you, Dixon. Oh, it's oh no! It's 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 inside of him. He's got the. But you need it. the technical part, right? You do, and you need to put the right people together for the right songs and all this. It's a, it's not so easy as it sounds. I don't doubt that it's not easy. Believe no, me. No, I mean it's like arranging <laughs> a group to work in your lab to do. It's like getting cooperation and getting people to. That's pretty hard too. It, it's very difficult. <laughs> it is hard. Very difficult. Brianne, what do you have for us? Um, so I have uh, something called Cell Picture Show, 
Um, and I've actually used this in some of my classes for years. Um, so Cell um, has this website where there are kind of short um, slideshows of microscopy images um, from different types of studies or kind of surrounding different topics. Um, and they're just absolutely gorgeous. Um, and every time I look at them, oh. I sort of can't even believe that someone can do microscopy that looks that beautiful. <laughs> um, yeah, I, that one of the, the recent great. ones I really like is in the cancer killers. They have this beautiful um, kill, CD8 killer T cell um, interacting with the tumor cell. Um, it, it's just gorgeous. Yeah. These pretty, are beautiful. Beautiful stuff. Yep. So, Brianna, I presume you're a big fan of uh, the Nikon Small World Contest. Yes. So this yeah. is um, an addition to that, and this is yeah. quite wonderful. Yep. It's beautiful. beautiful. Now, these beautiful. could be uh, entrants, right? They're gorgeous. For yes. sure. Yes. It's very nice. there, there are a lot, Vincent, of um, neurons and uh, neuroscience yes. images, mm. um, which remind me sometimes of some of the data I've seen from you. So. Well, the invertebrates uh, one is crazy. <laughs> these these things are really from nice. outer space. Uh, my pick is a website called uh, Our World in Data. And, you know, this might have been picked before, but they have a section on the pandemic. They have a lot of data, right? And they have a section on the pandemic, which has all kinds of amazing graphs that you can look at and customize to exactly what you want. And you can download it. But I, I was interested in vaccinations. Actually, I was on a call the other night and someone showed this. This is someone from Israel. And of course, they showed this because Israel has the best doses per 100 people of any country <laughs> in the world. Uh, way beyond the next country is United Arab Emirates. And then the UK and, and the US are down there. Way down, though. It's really uh, stunning to see this. And you can play with it. You can take countries out. You can add countries. You can look at confirmed cases. So there's a, a, a button at the top. You can just go confirmed cases per uh, nine, per million people, you know, cumulative. You can do confirmed deaths. You can do case fatality. You can do tests. What country has performed the most tests per thousand people? United Arab Emirates. Over 2,500 tests per thousand people. And we are around a thousand tests per thousand people. Anyway, if you like data and like to display it, this is an amazing site. You could spend a lot of time here. So there's a tab on this uh, vaccinations one that's, uh, uh, that interests me, and that's the map. Yeah. Yeah. That shows the distribution and shows uh, that we uh, have work to do with respect to making sure that this is distributed globally. I do. We have a lot of work. Africa yeah. at this point is more or less left out. Yep. Yeah. Vincent, yeah. has anybody decided to go back and test the people who have already been vaccinated, you know, in the clinical trials? Are they, are they doing a routine testing on those people? Uh, for what infection? For the yeah, no, no, not for the infection. Just to make sure that they're still reactive. Well, um, there are. There's a two year follow up for all of okay. these phase three trials, and what they are doing varies according to the company. But yeah. you know, minimum they're tracking anything that happens to them. I'm sure they have an app that they're doing a daily thing with. Um, I'm not. I don't know about taking samples. I'm sure they're taking serum periodically and looking to see how long. You know, the, the reactions right. last. Uh, right. And they may, if right. they're smart, they do PCR periodically, right? Send yeah, in that's, a, that's a right. nasal that's swab, right. just right. mail it in. I would do that if it were my trial to see sure. if there's infection. So, okay. yeah. They, they could also just look for N antibodies. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And to see if you've been infected, I guess, yeah. That would be easy. You wouldn't have to do Just PCR. look for another antigen yeah. other than the, uh, the spike, spike protein. Yeah. That's right. I'm actually impressed with this, uh, Vincent, that the coverage in the U.S. with uh, two doses is uh, nearly 20%. It's pretty good. That's great. Yeah, that's pretty good. That yeah, is great. It's gone up a lot in the last month. 
Yeah, and <laughs> I would like it, to see a map continues to go up. I'd love to see a map of the United States where all of those points are put onto the map to see where the immunizations have occurred in clusters bigger than 20%. Such a thing probably exists. Yeah, I'm sure it does. You I can do actually know. download the raw data for any of these. They have them oh, really? okay. you know, as, okay. fi- as Excel files, and you could massage them. You could do that. Dixon with your I do programming know that skills. As of, uh, as of uh, a because week or so ago, the state in the U.S. with, uh, you probably know this, Dixon, because you watch Virginia. the news hour, West Virginia. That's the one. That is the one. So the, the, I we had one of the, um, I guess it was Brevias or something like that, where we were talking about uh, targeting advertising for vaccines to various groups mm-hmm. to get more buy-in. Uh, because the yeah, ads are yeah. not very convincing, to be honest, they're they're not. There are ads on TV. Yeah, I, have, I don't. Lots see. of them. What are they from the State Departments of Health and uh, that sort of thing? And what do they say? And Go some get of them vaccinated. Are very convincing, and others are. Eh. Dixon, I think they should get you on an ad. You know what? Because you're folksy. You're I very know, folksy. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. I'm, I, I, in you know, fact, I why don't they get me, that you and Brienne, you got both ends of the age spectrum here. you got <laughs> folksy Brienne Dixon it, I, and I cheery be Brienne. Brienne. <laughs> yeah, I think that would be great. All right, let's go. <laughs> I would totally do it. I, I would, that I would do. Because yeah, I don't do, do anything unless it's fun. <laughs> Is that why you do TWIV? I love doing this show. All right. I'm I don't glad just to like it. it. I love doing it. You love this doing show. it? Yeah, well, we enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. Twiv, microbe.tv slash twiv is where you can find the show notes. If you have a question or a comment, send it to twiv at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Dixon de Pommier, who really enjoys twiv, who loves it. He does. <laughs> He's at trichinella.org and thelivingriver.com. Thank you, Dixon. You're very welcome, Vincent. Very welcome. And the Tuesday TWIV is like Friday TWIV, more or less. I, you know what? Now I don't have to worry about Fridays except for my teaching obligations. So I'm, I'm actually, I, I, I'm, com- I'm cool with this. If you don't mind, I'll switch to Tuesdays. Do you mind? I don't mind. <laughs> is that okay? It's okay with me. All right. I'll, I'll do it because I, I think like Kathy, uh, she's got teaching and she switched her date. So I'll, I'll switch mine. She teaches on Friday. Happens. Yeah. I don't know. I think she might. I, I think she does actually. Mm. But this is this feels more comfortable. I, I I've, I've enjoyed this very much. Well, I wonder why it shouldn't. It should feel the same. No, but you have to come up with a pick of the week, and you got to read the mail, and you know, come on. There's a lot to do, and you know, if you don't get it done, then you feel guilty or something. I don't know. Oh my gosh, <laughs> Dixon, we we don't want to make you feel guilty. Just chill. No, I actually I don't. Feel guilty. Rich Condit's an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure thing. And Dixon, guess what? There's a page in this our uh, si- a subsite in this our world on data that's yes. about the U.S. that takes it apart state by state. Ah, lovely. It doesn't have doesn't have maps, but it's got enough bar charts to keep you up all night. Oh, it's that's amazing! Great. Oh, it's I'll amazing. It's I'll what a site, man! It's just great. It's great so for always for, a good time. Uh, for lectures. I'll say that. So always great for lectures, Brian. You can get all kinds of figures <laughs> to illustrate things. It's really good for that. Nice. Brian Barker is a Drew University bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thank you, Brian. Thanks. It was great to be here. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back in a couple of days. Another TWIV is viral. Viral.